September 28th, Philadelphia. The Liberty Loan Parade is in full swing. Thousands march in the streets. Hundreds of thousands watch. Few know that health officials have pressured the mayor to cancel the event. Women wave flags. A child sits on his father's shoulders. The crowd falls silent for a simulated bombing run. Airplanes buzz overhead. Anti-aircraft guns fire blanks into the sky. The crowd, necks craned, tries to imagine what it's like to be in mortal peril. Little do they know, they already are. The flu was already burning in Philadelphia, but after the Liberty Loan Parade, it explodes. Three days later, the hospitals start to fill. With the war sapping medical professionals, there aren't enough doctors or nurses, and the hospital staff starts to die. Though colleagues fall around them, doctors and nurses stay at their posts. Some in private practice make 60 house calls a day. Over a thousand die that first week, and in three weeks, the death toll approaches 5,000. The dead quickly begin to overwhelm Philadelphia. Morticians post staff at hospitals to free up beds the moment victims expire. If a patient starts turning blue, nurses tag them for the morgue. It saves time. But the morgue is out of space and refuses to accept more bodies. Workers keep doors and windows open to dissipate the stench, and fluid runs out the door and into the gutter. The Catholic Church gets involved, mobilizing clergy to help clear the backlog. When the priests enter the morgue, they find 400 bodies. They're everywhere. Lying on desks and stacked in corners, the building is at 12 times its maximum capacity. Things are no better at graveyards. Pre-burial vaults are full. The city has run out of coffins and wood to build coffins. People use wheelbarrows and potato sacks to bring loved ones to the cemetery, then leave them there. Once again, the church steps in, hiring a construction crew to dig trenches with steam shovels. They stack the coffins too deep while recording exactly where each person is buried. At night, citizens hear them reciting Latin prayers over the mass grave. But that took time to organize. And for weeks, thousands are not buried at all. With hospitals, morgues, and cemeteries refusing to accept corpses, people have to live with the dead in their homes. And many families are so ill that they can't move a corpse at all and simply sleep, eat, and live next to the deceased. Weeks in, Philadelphia leaders finally rent a warehouse as an overflow morgue. Organized teams of policemen and priests circle the city, collecting the dead in horse-drawn carts. Philadelphia would be the worst-hit city in America, with half a million cases. By the end of October, the city government almost ceased to function, and private citizens stepped in to run the response. People volunteered cars as ambulances and worked as dispatchers at medical phone banks, a primitive 911. But just up the coast, it was a different story. While the head of New York's Board of Health had been slow to respond, the city had experience fighting epidemics like polio and tuberculosis. The Public Health Service had a major presence and experience screening and quarantining people at the Port of New York. In fact, the port had started quarantining ships the moment reports of the flu arose on the Western Front. But the war made full quarantine impossible. The city instituted laws criminalizing spitters and people who failed to cover their mouths when they coughed or sneezed. They posted notices urging the sick to stay home under voluntary quarantine, report illnesses to a doctor, and they called for people to wear gauze masks. The Board of Health surveyed neighborhoods to track the spread. They set up medical centers that dispatched doctors and nurses on house calls. And most importantly, they convinced businesses to stagger working hours and shopping times, reducing crowds on public transit. But even in New York, the press continued to minimize the outbreak in order to protect morale. And it was the same in cities and towns across America, even as the disease spread west. Newspapers would claim there was nothing to worry about one day, and then the next announced that all public gathering places were closed. The result was uncertainty and fear. Everyone knew newspapers were covering it up. People could see the obituaries. They saw the Red Cross ads begging for nurses. Families tracked the flu coming down the rail line or highway via letters and articles buried in the back pages. It was in the next state the next county, the next town, and finally next door. In this climate of mistrust, rumors grew. One conspiracy theory claimed the flu was a bioweapon released from German U-boats off the Atlantic coast. Another said that the German-owned Bayer Corporation had poisoned its aspirin with the disease. A rumor ran around Phoenix that dogs carried the disease, and as a result, 
Arizonians killed thousands of strays and pets. And in San Francisco, a policeman shot a man who refused to comply with new flu mask laws. Evangelist Billy Sunday claimed the disease was a punishment visited upon a sinful nation and held a mass prayer meeting to end the epidemic. Several in the crowd collapsed of flu while praying for deliverance. Whole towns isolated themselves, hiring armed guards. The flu got in anyway, arriving with mailmen and milk trucks. Shops began asking customers to shout their orders, then leave the money on the doorstep. The owner would take the money and leave the goods. Children distilled this paranoia into a jump rope rhyme, one that captured the sense of an unwanted visitor invading the home. I had a little bird and her name was Enza. I opened up the window and in flew Enza. The country needs something to stop this nightmare. At the Rockefeller Institute, they isolate Pfeiffer's bacillus in mid-October, and the Army Medical School begins the process of injecting it into horses, drawing their blood, and isolating the antibodies for a vaccine. By October 25th, the vaccine is ready. Express trains rush deliveries to the West Coast to protect troops and shipbuilders there. They've made enough to vaccinate the entire U.S. Army and its civilian employees, but only enough for the Army. For the duration of the war, the Rockefeller Institute was a military organization, and therefore their work focused on the military. No matter how much mayors and governors begged for vaccine, they wouldn't receive a single vial. It took a parallel civilian effort to provide relief to the public. At the New York Hygienic Lab, Williams labors over lung samples from hospitals and orphanages, trying to find whether Pfeiffer's exists in a majority of victims. And she finds it. Everywhere. She isolates a sample and proves antibodies can bind to it further confirming it was the culprit. That done, she cultures vast quantities of Pfeiffer's, leader upon leader, then hands them off to Park, who rushes upstate to mass-produce vaccine at his farm. Deep down, researchers knew this was not good science. The process had been too fast. No one really knew whether Pfeiffer's caused the flu, and if, as some suspected, the culprit was a virus invisible to microscopes, these vaccines would do nothing. It was, one researcher said, like fighting a ghost. Still, it was worth trying. There was a possibility they'd accidentally snare the disease-causing agent in their sample, and the horses would make antibodies for it. That was how the first rabies vaccine happened, after all. In fact, one Rockefeller researcher counted on this, producing a vaccine that contained antibodies for every bacteria he could find, all mixed together, hoping that one would stop the disease. Even as they rolled out the vaccine, Surgeon General Gorgas cautioned it was experimental, and no one knew if it would work. And it didn't. Labs across the country produced dozens of vaccines, and none of them prevented flu. Because flu was, as some feared, an invisible virus. Yet despite that failure, medical science was not helpless. They could do little for patients killed directly by the flu, the ones that turned blue, but they could fight the opportunistic pneumonias that followed it. The anti-pneumonia vaccine and serum Avery had worked on during the earlier measles epidemic was effective and likely saved some people. Thousands of troops took it. On the surgical side, doctors developed a new procedure to enter the lungs and drain the sacs of pus that drowned patients. Others used oxygen, x-rays, and cardiac stimulants to support ailing victims. But nurses provided the most valuable care. There were too few doctors, too many patients, not enough medicine, and what treatments they had often took too long to administer en masse. Nurses, on the other hand, could keep patients hydrated, warm, and breathing comfortably. They could ease coughs and lower temperatures. And that kind of long-term care probably affected a patient's survival more than anything a doctor could do in the few minutes they had at each bedside. Added to that, the Red Cross developed a system that predicted the flu's cycle of infection when it would die down in one area and spring up in another, letting them deploy emergency teams of nurses before they were needed. But as everyone from city officials and the Red Cross responded to the crisis, there was one man who refused to do anything, President Wilson. When briefed about the deadly influenza outbreak, the one question on his mind was whether he should order the troop ships to continue ferrying soldiers to France. He did, and the flu kept killing. 